Hello, this is Dominion Hour with uh, Pastor Masi Gidenji Gitonga and uh, at this Dominion Hour we discuss Dominion things, we're talking about Dominion grace at this hour and uh, as we began last Friday dealing with a Joseph generation, that's what we're going to continue with today, a Joseph generation. So please uh, grab your cup of tea and uh, Grab somebody, ask them to watch, and uh, we can be blessed together. So why don't we start with a word of prayer. Father, indeed, we come before you. We thank you, even for the gift of dominion. We thank you for the work of our hands. We thank you for the graces you have bestowed upon each one. And that, Father, we ask that there may be a manifestation of that which is within us, so that we can be able to be productive and to bless our world and advance the kingdom of God even in the marketplace. We thank you, Lord. We pray for that one watching that, Lord, you may empower them and lift them up from where they are at and bring them closer to yourself and also lift them at their point of need so that, Lord, your name may be glorified in that blessing. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Now, a Joseph generation. And uh, we will do scriptures as usual. I hope you love the word because the word is what changes you and I. The word is what gives us the strength, the power, and the grace to carry on what we need to carry on on the earth. So as we talk about a Joseph generation, we are looking at redefining things, redefining things that uh, this story of Joseph helps us to redefine the way we look at a number of things. And uh, let's begin by Joseph as a slave. Joseph as a slave. The story goes that Joseph, the son of Jacob, was sold by his brothers. To First he was thrown into a pit, then he was sold because of jealousy. Joseph was loved by his father and... Uh, they sold him out. He was bought by some Ishmaelites who sold him to Potiphar, a guy who worked as a guard at Pharaoh's chambers in Egypt. And this is what the Bible says, Genesis 39, 1 to 3. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Now, already there we begin to redefine success. How does a man prosper? Or how is a man called successful when he has been sold? When he is a slave in a foreign land? When his heart is bleeding from the betrayal of his own brothers? How does a man then be defined as a prosperous man or a successful man? Now, when we look at life carnally, we only see doom and gloom in a situation like that. If you're looking at life carnally, you will see doom and gloom in such a situation. And I mean, look at him. He's come from the comfort of his own family and he has been, you know, first of all thrown into a pit. Then they decided let's not kill him. He was sold, he became a slave. So what we may see is that, hey, this guy's life is finished. It is possible to think that way. If you're looking at things carnally, you'll begin to say his life is finished. There are times we also begin to say my life is finished. Why? I don't have a job. I don't have money. I don't have this. Something is going on in my life. Somebody has left. Somebody has left me. We may begin to think in the same manner that it is finished, that things are done with you. But really, when uh, you look at uh, God's purposes and plans, then 
you see something else. You will need to look at that situation of Joseph with the eyes of faith to see how God sees things. Even how God is seeing him as Joseph and the purpose of God for him. So we read that the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. Wow. A new definition of success, the Lord with you equals to success. The Lord with you equals to success. Joseph, we're not saying that everything is good and rosy. That's not what success is about here. Joseph has to deal with the issues of huge magnitude. He has to do with the issues of his physical freedom. You know, when you're a slave somewhere, first of all, it's a foreign land. It means you can't escape. You can't do what you want to do when you want to do it. You are under the, the mercy of your master. You're amongst other slaves. You're considered a slave. You're not considered one of the, you know, one of them. It doesn't look like a pretty picture. But then we get to see as long as the Lord is with Joseph, he is successful in spite of the circumstance. Joseph is a prisoner after that. We read that, I mean, he goes from one situation, from one bad situation to a worse one. We read that um, Joseph's master, Genesis 39, 20, took him and put him into prison. Those who know the story, you know that Potiphar's wife had an eye on him. And when Joseph did not uh, give in to her demands, uh, she made a lie out of the story and Joseph is thrown into prison. So we read Genesis 39 from verse 20. Then Joseph... Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Notice that the Lord was with Joseph, even while Joseph was a slave. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Now, very interesting is that still there's something that is not changing, even though the circumstance is changing that the Lord is with Joseph. Wow. The Lord is with Joseph. So he is a slave, even a prisoner, but he doesn't carry the mind of a slave or the mind of a prisoner. He carries a different mind. And that is why you're beginning, you're just seeing prosperity happens wherever he goes. He is a carrier of grace. He is a carrier of prosperity, regardless of what the circumstance is. So we go on to see that um, what can we really say from this, these two scenarios? First, he's a slave, he's called successful, and everything prospers in his hand by the Spirit of the Lord. Then he is a prisoner, he leads others, and still everything prospers in his hand. So what, what can we dig in from this you know, story? So Joseph, we see, goes through the process of death to self so that his prophetic destiny can be unveiled as he goes along in life. Joseph had had these visions early in life that he would be king, others would bow to him, and for sure you need to die to that kind of a vision because it is not something you can do yourself. And dying to that kind of a vision means it requires that you walk it in faith, not in the flesh, not by sight. You'd have to live that dream by faith. So it had to take uh, this story to, of Joseph uh, to go that way. Joseph is a type of Christ. When we read about him, it is for our teaching. We are not Joseph. Even when we say we are a Joseph generation, we are not him. But it is a type of Christ. And Christ is in us going through death for purposes of liberating a people. At that time, there was a famine in the land. And we see God used Joseph uh, through God's wisdom 
to bring prosperity to Egypt, where every other nation came to Egypt to just buy grain from there. That's Joseph's story. What is our story? Is that we live by faith. The Bible tells us that we died with Christ and we rose with Christ. So now we live by faith. Let me read it so that you can see what it's about. Galatians 2, 20, 20 and 21. The Bible says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. There goes. When we believe in Jesus, he is like he has conquered us. We died with him so that we can rise with him. So it is no longer us. Now we live by faith so that also it is a work of grace. So if grace is operating in my life, it is because of faith. If grace is operating in your life, it is because of faith. So it is no longer a walk of walking by sight. It is walking by faith. And so grace becomes manifest in our lives. So when we look at Joseph, we, look, we see that um, he operates in his kingly position, even as a slave and even as a prisoner. In Potiphar's house, he is governor of his house. In prison, he has authority over the other prisoners. He is a leader. He takes charge of people. Isn't that what kings do? Kings are governors. They administrate resources. They administrate institutions. They govern nations. They manage resources and distribute them justly. They lead others. When we look at Joseph, we are looking at a kingly grace. A kingly grace. That by faith we can walk in our kingly grace. That regardless of the circumstance, you and I have that kingly grace inside of us. What does Revelations 5.10 tell us? We, ha we are kings and priests unto God and we shall reign on the earth. So when a believer finds themselves in the marketplace, just be king where God has sent you. And it doesn't matter where. You could be in Potiphar's house. You really can be in, um, in Pharaoh's chambers, working there. Be a king, because kingship is in you. Why? How do I know that? The king of kings is in you, so you can walk in that kingly grace. Usually the problem comes when we judge everything from a place of, you know, I am my situation, I am what is happening to me, I am my condition, and that's not the truth. The nature of God inside of us does not change because the circumstance has changed. And how do we know that? If we peep into the story of Joseph, where now he becomes a prince of Egypt, still there's something that doesn't change. He continues in his kingliness in that position. There's something that doesn't change. As God was with him as a slave, as God was with him as a prisoner, now God continues to be with him as a prince. So that is not changing. Only circumstances have changed. <coughs> Excuse me. Only circumstances have changed and uh, but the king in him has not changed. Uh, allow us to take a, a break and uh, we can come back and continue with the, the story of Joseph, a Joseph generation 
And it is my prayer that you're getting something. You might be in a condition that has really put you down, as was with Joseph. God is calling us to arise to a place of faith. Calling us to arise to a place of faith that there is much more in you than what is on the outside. He that is in us is greater than what we see surrounding us, even our conditions. And that begins to be a place where it, it becomes a turning point when you believe things the way we are seeing them in the Bible. God bless you as you grab your water, grab somebody, come and watch and let's be blessed together. Amen. <laughs> this is Dominion Hour and this is Pastor Masi Girenji Gitonga and bringing us uh, the word of Dominion. I think I can refer to myself as a Dominion champion. That's what I do, champion Dominion. I would like to see by the grace of God that we are all walking in our Dominion mandate and nobody is left behind. So call somebody up and tell them, hey, this is the Dominion Hour. We are watching and we are discussing some serious things concerning our dominion. Amen. Now, we left off at the place where we are looking at the journey of Joseph. He was a slave. He became a prisoner going from bad to us. And then he became prince. And we are saying there's something that didn't change. Geography can change. Circumstances can change. But there's something that doesn't change. God with you. And for us, he's in us. So the nature of God is not changing, even as these circumstances are changing. And that nature, as we have described it, is the kingly grace. We are seeing the kingly grace in Joseph as a slave. He is governor of the household. He is learning how to govern. He's managing resources and he is prospering. Everything he touches prospers in his hand because the Lord is with him. And that's how it works even now in the marketplace. You can be a leader in a company or you could be operating on a desk in a company looking as if nobody knows you. I want to tell you something. God knows you. He knows your place. He knows your position. He has your destiny in place and he is working it out. And I want you to believe with me that you have something on the inside of you that God wants expressed on that station, on that desk, in Jesus' name, regardless what it is. You can even be a domestic worker. God is still working in you. God can use you. God can use you. Now, we look at um, when we see things like that in the Bible, they begin to shift the way we think. And like I was saying before the break, it becomes a turning point for you and me when we begin to see the treasure in us that is greater than all the soil and debris and everything else, the circumstance that surrounds us. It becomes a turning point. So let's read Genesis 41 and let's look at this guy as prince. He was also prosperous. Look at this guy as prince. Genesis 41, 38 to 43. It is scripture time. And Pharaoh, some people say Pharaoh, I'm in Africa. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Now, how did that happen? Well, Joseph was in prison. He is called out into the king's palace to interpret some dreams. Because even in prison, he was interpreting dreams. His gifts are not dying even when he's in prison. Don't let, your, don't let your, your gift die. It has been given to you and it's worked out by faith. So his gift brings him before the king. It is true that your gift will take you before kings. So don't let it die. Just because you're in a bad situation, you have a gift in you and it will take you before kings. Hallelujah. So Joseph is brought before the king to interpret the dream. 
And so you hear the king say, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? When you are a man who allows the spirit to dwell in you, and you also dwell in his presence, people will see, even those who do not know God, they can discern, God will let them discern that there's something about that person that is different. Even in that company you work in, they will say there's something different about this person, a man in whom is the spirit of God. So then Pharaoh say to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Pharaoh is agreeing that, yes, God has shown you these things, but you are walking in them. You are walking in that wisdom of God. So there's no one as wise as you. You know, when you use God's wisdom, you look very wise. In fact, you are wise. That is what Pharaoh is saying. They will consider you wise, yet it is God's wisdom. How? You and God are one. We are one spirit with him. So you will be considered wise. And as they celebrate you as wise, please remember it is for the glory of God. They may want to kiss your hands how wise you are, but really they are kissing Jesus who is on the inside of you and you're a partner with him. In fact, you're one with him. Now, so Pharaoh says, you shall be over my house. So he's been promoted. And all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Where? Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Where? A promotion there. God is still with Joseph. Nothing has changed. It is not that now Joseph, I mean God, has brought all his goodies to Joseph now. Hapana. While he was a slave, the Lord was with Joseph. While he was a prisoner, the Lord was with Joseph. And now as a prince, the Lord just continues to be with Joseph. It's not like the Lord has just shown up. No, he has been and always be. He has been and always be. God is not governed by your circumstance. That's a serious statement, that God is not governed by your circumstance. But your circumstance is governed by God. Eh, that's a good one. So here, Joseph, <laughs> I'm enjoying myself in the studio. This is Mercy, and uh, we continue with the Joseph generation, if you're joining us now. And uh, we're discussing this Joseph generation and how God was with Joseph as a slave, as a prisoner, and as a prince. Now, one of the challenges we may have is we may not be able to see that grace that's in a man, that, gr that grace that we carry, because many times we're just looking on the outside. We are looking at the problem and not looking at the nature of God that we carry. I want to do a demonstration with this bottle of water. Yeah, this is a bottle of water. And, um, you know, when you go to the shop, you don't say, give me a bottle. You say, give me water. But then it comes in a bottle. And um, so what you're taking is not a bottle. What you're taking is the water. And uh, many times when you just look at yourself as the external bodily container you have, you may miss out on seeing the treasure that dwells inside of you, just as this water is in this bottle. And I'm not saying the bottle is not important. It is. How? Because the water has to come packaged in something. The water is the superior. It is the greater. But it has to come packaged in something. It's just like a house and its owner. A house can be beautiful. It is excellent. But it is the ones who dwell in it who make it a home. It is the ones who dwell in it that, you know, that make the house what it is. So water, you ask for water, you don't ask for a bottle. At least that's, 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 that's what we do where I come from. <laughs> you ask for water. Or let's say you ask for a cup of coffee. Really, you don't want a cup. 
you want the content. So there's container and content. The people in the studio are giving me that look, yes. There's container and there is content. The content inside is what you carry from God and uh, is alive, is alive. The content, very important. The container is just as beautiful. Look at it, very beautiful. And it is needed for carrying the content. So love yourself. Love the body in, in which you came in. And, uh, but may God open your eyes to see the content. Because that content is what begins to shift your life. Some of you have been blind to the content in you for too long and God is calling you and calling you out. God is calling out that content inside of you, the nature of God. Inside of you is love, inside of you is grace, inside of you is kingly grace like we are seeing with Joseph in Egypt. So now this content, the kingly grace that is in you is not affected by the circumstance. Now this bottle of water, the bottle may fall into the mud, but the content is preserved on the inside. The Bible talks to us about we carry incorruptible seed. What's on the inside of you is not corruptible. The nature of God is not corruptible. The problem comes when we adapt the mentalities of the situation even though on the inside of you is kingly grace. You may begin to look at yourself as a victim and not a king. Now, when you begin to do that, it becomes difficult for you to, turn, to have situations turning around because you have decided who you are according to the circumstance, and that's not the truth. So you find you're struggling, and we don't want you to struggle. That's why you are watching today. God wants you to see that the content on the inside is greater than what is around, and that's the turning point. So God is calling you out to this turning point of understanding what you carry and that the nature of God doesn't change that's on the inside of you, but circumstances indeed will change. God inside of you is not changing, circumstances will change. So yes, the seed is incorruptible and the seed of God is preserved even when this bottle falls in the mud. It is sealed. The Bible talks of us being sealed by the Holy Spirit. And uh, you have uh, the content well preserved, incorruptible. And uh, with that, you begin to see how precious and how, what God, you know, how God looks at you. He sees the treasure in you, the Christ in you. And amazing and very beautiful to have a revelation is that the seed in you is blessed. It is going to prosper in any environment. The seed in you is blessed. It's going to prosper in any environment. Shida or where the problems come is when we begin to adopt the mindset of the circumstances. Don't allow your circumstance to minister unbelief to you. God is calling you out even now. Begin to speak to that situation. Let the situation know that your God is bigger than it. Let your situation know the God that you believe in. You may just have a little faith, but you have a little faith in a big God. A little faith in a big God. So those are the turning points we keep seeing in life to turn away from, uh, you know, to just have Christ being manifest in your life. So the seed in you is blessed and you're being called out to understand that yes, you are not your circumstance. What is on the inside of you is what matters. Now, when we are out in the world, in the marketplace, we carry that same nature. So all our training in church, I think maybe you go to church or maybe you don't, Perhaps you learn, you know, through the TV, but if you can go to church, we are, we are called to go to church and join the rest of the brethren, that um, 
We have been trained in the word of God. So what do you do with it? When you go out into the world, into the marketplace, you are carrying that same nature and you're supposed to bring it out where God has sent you. There's nothing like church is spiritual and work is, is secular. No, if you're a believer, carrying on the nature of God, carrying on the spirit of God, wherever you go, wherever you go, it's going to be spiritual, whatever you do, because it is the Christ in you. It's not secular, the work that you do. It's not secular. Those are the separations that make us not, you know, you find somebody before they became a politician, they were very good. They were good uh, churchgoers, good values. But when they became a politician, things changed. Things should not change because that nature of God in you should not be affected by geography or a change in position, or a change in job, it should continue because you are the carrier of that grace, of that nature. And I want to say this, that um, our primary calling is sonship. Long before you can be a pastor, an engineer, an accountant, a cameraman, you're first called to be a son of God. The Bible says to all those who believed, he gave them power to be called the sons of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 to 13. When you think about it that way, then your job becomes your pulpit. Your work becomes the place you express the son of God that you carry. So if you're an accountant, go be the greatest and best accountant you can be. Be king with the mathematics. If you're an engineer, go ahead. Be creative. You carry the grace of God. He is creative. Don't let people starve when you can make a piece of equipment. You're in agriculture. That's your pulpit. Why are people dying in northern Kenya when there are rains in different parts of Kenya? Why, 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 why? When you're a carrier of God, you carry the grace of God so that you can express the Son of God in your situation wherever he sends you. So this way, if we are thinking this way, that this is sons of God in the marketplace, then we are going to put in the systems that work, that are godly. We'll use methods that are godly. We are going to have ideologies that are not contrary to the word of God. We are going to be able to do things in the marketplace, influencing the marketplace for God. Even that is evangelism. Evangelism is not just about standing somewhere crusade with a microphone. It is where you are working with the people you are with. God is calling you out. So the importance of the Joseph generation and this story in our times today is first of all, like we have seen, start to redefine things. It calls for a redefinition, redefining your goals, pursuing your purpose, no matter where it leads you, loving unconditionally, like Joseph did, loved his brothers, forgave them after all the things they did to him, walking in indescribable grace, being able to represent God by faith in your workplace and in your situation. These are also the times that will require the preserving of the seed the seed is not really preserved in the Bible. It is preserved in us. We are the granaries that carry the word of God. We are the seed. We are the place where the seed is preserved. We are the place that where seed is preserved. So God is calling you to allow yourself to become the ground where the seed of God is sown and where the seed of God bears fruit. He's calling us out to be a preserver of God's word. Be somebody who loves and enjoys the word of God. Ask him to give you that grace. Because when you become somebody who allows the word of God in, 
You're a ground that is blessed because it produces and it bears fruit. The seed in you is blessed and so are you blessed if you're a carrier of the seed of God. Do you remember Mary, the mother of Jesus, and what the angel said? Blessed are you among women. Why? She was carrying the seed of God. She was carrying the seed of God. You are blessed, you are not cursed. You are blessed if you are a carrier of seed. So a lot of turning points today. As we close, let's read Colossians 3.16. And verse 17, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wow become a carrier of the word that makes you a carrier of grace why don't we pray father we commit these things that we have spoken from your word to you because lord you're the only one who can water it and grow it and make it manifest we pray for the manifestation of christ in the marketplace that that one watching will become a manifester of Christ. That one watching will not take on the condition they are in, but instead they will have a revelation of the kingliness, the kingly grace that they carry. And we pray that there be a turnaround in their lives in the name of Jesus. We pray for you who is watching that the turnaround happens now by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. That things will begin to turn around. Circumstances are going to shift because because you are a carrier of kingly grace. We pray for you that that grace may arise and cause you to walk even before other kings and that your situation is no longer going to go by the old story, but God may give you a new story and a new testimony. We pray even for this nation that even our leaders, even in the people, the people in the marketplace will begin to see what they do as a pulpit, as a place where we can influence the nation for God. We thank you, Father, for what you have granted us as your sons, even giving us that authority and dominion. We present it to you, we surrender it to you, so that you may use it through us. Just like you did with Joseph, we are praying for this generation at such a time as this, that we may see an arising of a Joseph generation. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next Friday on Dominion Hour. This has been your host, Pastor Masi Gidenji Gitonga, speaking about a Joseph generation. Bye.